David, will you um would you be willing to lead us in opening prayer, please? Oh, definitely. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful opportunity that we can gather and and uh, get into your word and really talk about how you lead out the church in the New Testament according to your pattern and and Christ church and we just uh we pray that we can uh obtain what you want us to share to people from what we study tonight and let us take it and go out into our lives and apply it in your son's name we pray amen amen thank you so much so all right well you guys know to um just unmute yourself and join in anytime you have a comment to make and i'm going to do a little bit of introductory stuff um here with the book of titus not a whole lot i you know i prefer to get right into the text um of scripture but titus is i i learned a lot prepping for uh this as it, of course that would always be the case but but especially with Titus, I, I was trying to think back, and I think I've done some classes where it was First Timothy, Second Timothy, and Titus. Um, but I don't know if I've ever done, and obviously this is just three weeks, but I don't know if I've ever done a class just on Titus. And this has been really fun uh, for me to to get ready for. So um, here's our little outline. Of course, today's May third, and we'll look at chapter one, and then chapter two next week, and chapter three on June sixth. So very very uh, simple outline that's for sure so i do want to show you before i do some introductory stuff from the niv archaeological study bible um this this is a map of paul's journey to rome and um and and that's not the main thing i want us to see the main thing i want us to see here on this map is where crete is because titus was charged by paul to stay on the island of crete and appoint elders and, and make sure things were going okay. And then uh, Paul writes Titus in this case, really to encourage him to keep doing it and to stay strong and especially to make sure that the, the proper teachings are being taught and the, the false teachers, just like John and his, his letters, you know, making sure false teachers, you know, well, uh, the, the word used here in Titus is muzzled, the literal word, um, you know, to get the false teaching to stop being promoted and make sure sound doctrine, sound truth and teaching is is being um, is being taught. And so um, there the island of Crete um, was under the rule of the Roman Empire. They uh, took control of it, I think, uh, about 50 years before Christ, even. So it was part of the Roman world, the Roman Empire. And uh, just so just right there, you can you can see Crete right in the middle of the uh, the screen right uh, between um, uh, Egypt and uh, Cyrene and, and Greece and what used to be called Asia now called Turkey. So um, just important for us to recognize where that is. So the the author is Paul and the recipient is Titus. Obviously, we most of the letters of the of the New Testament obviously are either titled by an author or a whole church. But with first and second Timothy and with Titus, uh, we have the recipient uh, named and, and with all of Paul's letters, we don't have Paul's, we don't have first Paul, second Paul, third Paul, fourth Paul. We'd have to go quite a bit ways if we named them by author. So all of his letters are by the recipient. Just normally they are churches except for those three. Uh, of course, you have people who fight the authorship and the inspiration of scripture and all sorts of things, but there's really no evidence to not um, just stick with what is the truth of the letter and from tradition, and that is that Paul was writing Titus. Um, in this, in the NIV Archaeological Study Bible, it says in that second little line there under author, place, and date of writing, it says, the letter to Titus was probably written from Nicopolis, in Western Greece, it was delivered by Zenos and Apollos, who were on a journey that took them through Crete. But a lot of people feel that this was written to Titus while Paul was in Rome in his Roman imprisonment. So 
Uh, dating these things precisely is always really, really tough uh, to do. Uh, the audience, this letter was written by Paul to one of his associates, Titus, a Gentile Christian. We'll look at Galatians 2, 1 through 10 in just a little bit, who had probably been converted through Paul's ministry and was presently overseeing the churches on Crete. Titus had traveled with Paul and became his trusted associate. After Paul's release from his first Roman imprisonment, he and Titus had ministered briefly on Crete. Um, when Paul departed, he left Titus behind to continue the ministry, organize the churches, and appoint elders. So you can see from uh, this statement uh, here in the audience, this the people who put these notes together in this study Bible uh, think Paul had two different Roman imprisonments. Um, Paul plainly stated that he had left Titus on Crete in order to set the churches there in order, both organizationally and doctrinally. The letter was intended to encourage Titus and give him further instruction for accomplishing this task. Paul apparently regarded the Cretans as a particularly difficult group to work with. Um, we'll look at the little article on Crete in a second. In New Testament times, life on Crete had sunk to a deplorable moral level, uh, similar to Corinth, probably. Those who had become Christians were immature in their faith and needed basic instruction concerning immorality and Christian conduct. In addition, false teachers of various kinds were troubling the Cretan churches. So um, on this next slide, I have this little teeny article on Crete. Um, uh, it's south of the Greek mainland. Um, it's the largest of the Greek islands. It's 156 miles long. So that would be from end to end, kind of probably from, if you were on 71, probably from Lake Erie uh, down south of Grove City. So and maybe even a little farther. So a, a big, long island, obviously, um, just 35 miles wide um, at its widest point. It was home to the Minoan civilization, a Mediterranean culture that reached its high point around 1500 BC. So we're talking way back, uh, but collapsed at the end of the Bronze Age in around 1200. And the most spectacular remains of this civilization may be viewed at Gnosis. Uh, there on the island. Crete is referred to in the Old Testament as Kaftor, and the Philistines came to Canaan by way of Crete. Crete does not figure significantly in history during the classical period, although the island is said to have been a base for pirates. It was brought under Roman rule in 67 BC, so a little earlier than I was thinking. Um, the island had a substantial Jewish population during the New Testament period, and Paul was troubled by the negative influence of some of these Jews on the early Christians. The Cretan poet who labeled his fellow Cretans as liars and lazy gluttons, and this quote, Paul quotes this quote in the letter. We're going to see it right here in chapter one. Um, it's supposed to have been written by uh, Epimenides, 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 although the original text is no longer available. So that's just by kind of tradition. Um, uh, here are the dates. You can see the book of Titus, uh, the book of Titus written. This this timeline has it around 63 to 65 uh, right here. And so still under Nero's reign and still during the time of the missionary journeys. Although, again, I'll just mention that a lot of people feel that Titus was written while Paul was uh, uh, in his one and only uh, imprisonment in Rome. You can see that this one has two different imprisonments uh, in Rome. So, all right, let's um, let's look at the did you know? It's kind of interesting. Crete, the fourth largest island in the Mediterranean Sea, was a Roman province populated primarily by farmers and fruit growers. Roman slaves had no legal rights. Their fates entirely are in their master's hands. In the Jewish sense, the term lawyer referred to an expert in the Mosaic law well, in the Gentile context, it referred to a Roman jurist, which, of course, makes sense. Um, three themes given in this book, uh, church leaders, self-control and integrity, make the gospel attractive, and then false teachers. And those are three very important things that we'll, we'll be looking at uh, tonight in the next couple of weeks. So, and here's an outline. Um, if you're watching this later, you can pause here, of course, and, and take a look at that. Those of you here live, you can um, uh, also look back at the recording and take a longer look at this. Uh, but you can see in the first chapter what we'll look at tonight. Paul gives quite a lengthy greeting uh, for him. You can see verses one through four. And then really, 
it doesn't come across in the English as well, but he really is contrasting elders and false teachers. And so we have verses five through nine, which give what we often refer to as the qualifications of elders, which is a good way of looking at it. But then there's um, a, a but in verse 10. So we have we have the elders and all the different things that they should be. And it ends with the idea that they should be teaching the truth. And then it says, but there are, you know, and then totally paraphrasing, there are those who are not teaching the truth. There are those who are false teachers. And so that's really what happens here in chapter one. There's quite a contrast. And I think we'll have um, um, a good time. I, I was, I think it'll be very interesting uh, for us to be looking at this text. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's look at verses one through four, first of all. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. To Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. So I'm going to go through and just highlight uh, some words for us to look at and look at a few other passages and then also obviously get input from you all if you would like. But the first thing I want us to notice is that Paul describes himself as a servant and as an apostle. And this is not unusual for Paul. He oftentimes calls himself a servant. This word for servant can mean slave or bond servant. It's a it's a it's a kind of an all-encompassing word uh, for being in servitude to someone. And he often, you know, often the translators will say slave, a slave of God. And Paul really did consider himself in that way. He considered himself holy belonging to God Almighty and his son, Jesus Christ. And what a what a great attitude. So he shows the humility and he shows his place in the big scheme of things, but he also is willing and should show his authority. And he is an apostle of Jesus Christ. And so the, the very humble title of servant or slave and the lofty title of apostle, which with it has uh, the authority uh, that God gave, that Christ gave more particularly uh, to the original 12, and then Matthias, and then Paul added in, as he would describe it as one untimely board. But um, Paul does have the authority as well. And these things can be hand in hand. We have so many ways in which we are described as Christians that some of which are, you know, have ideas like slavery and humility and uh, making sure we don't think too highly of ourselves, et cetera, et cetera. And then at the same time, we are called a royal priesthood. We're called the light of the world. We are ministers of reconciliation. We are partakers of the divine nature. Um, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. I mean, just on and on and on we have the the most amazing descriptions of ourselves as Christians in scripture, right along with the ideas of being humbled and being lowly and being last. And of course, Jesus, Paul's a great example of all this, but Jesus is the ultimate example of all this. He was the one who is actually God and Philippians 2 tells us that he was willing to let go of that, taking on human nature, and of course, dying for us, and not just death, but death on a cross. So really quite amazing. And so as Jesus was all these things at once, Paul is all these things at once, and we are all these things at once uh, as well. So really, it unless someone has a, a pretty full comprehensive grasp of what it means to be in Christ they might they might dwell on one or the other end of the spectrum a little too much uh, might start to feel a little haughty or a little cocky or someone might 
um, as some uh, different groups of uh, broadly speaking Christians actually uh, abusing themselves, actually giving themselves physical scars and and hurts in the name of Christ. Um, you know, just the extremes are not where we want to be. We want to have the comprehensive realization of everything that we are in Jesus. And I think that's really important. And Paul really makes that clear in a lot of his uh, letters. Um, the, 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 the next two words, faith and knowledge. And one thing that I've learned from Greg over the years, just over and over and over and over again, <laughs> is that these things are not in opposition. And the the people in Colossae, as as Gnosticism started moving into probably the Colossian church, and and when John was writing, you know that he was writing so much later than a lot of the other writers, you know he touches on these things, but but it's so important to realize that these are not in contrast. Now earthly knowledge is in contrast to faith, but real knowledge, the real truth, which is defined by God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Real truth and faith go hand in hand. There's there's no conflict in this. And so Paul brings these things out for Titus. He says, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and not just their faith, but their knowledge of the truth. Um, and we'll we'll continue on in a second. But that's that's real important. And this was nothing new. Uh, Psalm 9, verses 9 and 10 says, The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. So to have faith in someone, we have to know them. And that even comes out in uh, the book of Psalms. So let me continue on a little bit more and then see if there are any uh, comments here. Notice that this faith and knowledge, it accords or it agrees with, it's, it's in sync with uh, godliness and the hope of eternal life. And you know, obviously the, the idea of hope is oftentimes what keeps us going. If we didn't, if we didn't have knowledge, assurance of what is to come in the next life, it would be a, a very depressing thing to be in this world sometimes, or to deal with the hardships uh, that, that many of us have to deal with. So many people have to deal with pain or loss, and this can be physical or emotional or mental. I mean, just so many things going on. But the hope of eternal life, which comes from the faith and knowledge of the faith in God and the knowledge of the truth, and is in sync with being godly, keeps us going. It is really an amazing thing to have hope. We, I just I can't even imagine trying to go through this life without a knowledge of the next life. And we notice that this hope of eternal life, God promised, and it was manifested. Um, he manifested what was promised in Christ, um, and he will manifest what he has promised concerning the second coming of Christ. In Titus, um, in chapter 3, we read about the first coming of Christ, which we're all very familiar with, and we read about the second coming of Christ in chapter 3. Um, Jesus coming the first time obviously brought salvation. His coming the second time will bring all that to a point where we'll be in heaven uh, forever. Paul does take this part very personally. He says, uh, and and it's not really an aside. It's a very vast and profound truth. But God never lies. Um, God defines truth. He just he that's something he doesn't do and can't do. Um, but he promised before the ages began. And at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I've been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. So Paul has been entrusted. He is an apostle. He does bring out in this little paragraph um, his credentials, uh, so to speak. So uh, before we go to verse 4, anyone have anything they want to add or um, any encouragement from that? Yeah, mom or dad? Um, I was just thinking in today's world that a lot of people think that they just need faith and love with no knowledge of God. I mean, it's definitely not necessary to read the Bible, you know, or find out anything about him. But if they just have faith that he is, you know, then, of course, they don't have to worry about obedience because they don't even know hardly what 
they need to obey, you know. Yeah. So I just thought that's something that we we experience now. I yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean that's a great point. I was just talking with someone today, actually, right here in my office, um, um, about some Christians who, you know, just don't have any knowledge of the fullness of the Bible. They they understand like teachings on baptism and they understand teachings on repentance and confession, um, which are super important, absolutely crazy important to know about those things, but they haven't really been exposed to the richness of say the Psalms or Jesus parables even. It's it's a very it's it's a very shallow um knowledge. So yeah, you're you're right though. There are so many people who don't even believe in any knowledge at all. And then we have others that it's they've got a little, but not the richness of it. That's I'm just so thankful to be at a congregation where the elders and the whole staff believe and, and and all the members too i don't want to leave anyone out but the, our our leadership definitely believes in people knowing the bible from genesis to revelation and i just think it's fabulous and we're we're very very blessed in that and we'll we'll keep moving we keep needing to improve of course but um but as far as cherishing and believing in the bible um you know obviously we're strong in that and it's a great blessing uh, we we are just constantly exposed to wonderful truths. Anything else from one through three? All right, let's, um, again, anytime, just jump in. So to Titus. So at this point, let's, let's jump to Galatians because we, by the way, Titus's name is never found in the book of Acts. It, I mean, almost incredible. It almost seems impossible. Um, but then it's mentioned he's he is mentioned nine times in Second Corinthians, and quite a bit is said as Paul is defending himself to the churches of Galatia. So uh, Galatians two one through ten, he says Paul writing uh, to that those churches. Then after fourteen years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential set before them the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they might bring us into slavery, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. So we we know about the example of Timothy, that um, Paul did circumcise Timothy. And again, because of the work that he was going to do. But in this case with Titus, they wanted him to be circumcised for salvation. They, they wanted him to be circumcised to prove their point, to take away the freedom that is in Christ. And so that's why Paul says, we did not yield in submission even for a moment. Uh, they were not going to give in to that kind of thing. With Timothy, it was, okay, this is pretty expedient. This seems like a good thing to do. In Titus's case, it was going to be a, it was a statement and a conflict concerning how is someone saved? And they were not going to give in to a works uh, salvation. Then he continues, and from those who seemed to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. From those who seemed to be influential, those I say who seemed influential added nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And by the way, you can, you can, even in English, Paul is, I mean, it's very wordy and parenthetical statements and commas and dashes and all sorts of things to try to make the English clear. Um, this is why beginning Greek students never start with Paul's writings. It's always John, uh, because Paul is very, very complex. Lots of phrases and uh, prepositional phrases and adverbial clauses and all sorts of things. So, um, 
But verse 9, and when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. So anyway, so we we have a lot of Titus in 2 Corinthians. We have Titus as, as a pivotal character here at the beginning of Galatians, in, in contrast to what happened with Timothy to some extent. So back to Titus 1, uh, verse 4, to Titus, my true child in a common faith. And um, Paul, with Timothy and with Titus, we can really tell that he was a mentor to them, that he considered himself a father in the faith to both of them. He really wanted to make sure that they were moving along in the right direction. So he calls him his true child. And he also says, in a common faith, even though Paul was a Jew and Titus was a Gentile, they have a common faith. Um, of course, we sing the song, A Common Love, uh, quite often. And it's talking about not common in the sense of not fancy. Um, it's common in the sense of we are one in it. It is our common faith. It is the faith that we share together. And same with the love when we sing the song. So um, Paul has a very typical final part of the greeting uh, here, grace and peace. Uh, grace, um, he, he is, this is kind of a prayer, kind of a statement of, I want grace to be yours, Titus. I want peace to be yours, Titus. And the grace that is the free gift of blessings, of course, initially at salvation, at the moment of salvation, but also as we live the Christian life and then peace, uh, the reconciliation, the coming together of an individual with uh, with Christ, with God, um, through the Holy Spirit. So um, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. He had set up in verse 3, as you can see highlighted, God our Savior. And th there's obviously nothing inappropriate about that at all. Father, Son, and Spirit are involved in our salvation. Jesus Christ most specifically is our Savior, but God is at work in the saving work of Jesus Christ on the cross, in his sending, in his love. The Spirit is involved in our salvation um, by his presence in our lives, his sanctifying work, um, him being a seal of our salvation, and a down payment uh, for that. So, um, so just neat that Paul actually says these things this way entrusted by the command of God, our Savior, and then grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. Um, I also like when Greg says that uh, God is in the saving business, and he is. Uh, he wants people uh, to be saved. So, all right, before we move on to verses 5 through 9, any, any comments here? All right. So, verses 5 through 9, and we'll look at the uh, qualifications from elders. We'll, we'll briefly, we'll just, we'll just make sure we read them, but from, um, from 1 Timothy and from, um, um, oh, I just went blank for a second. Uh, 1 Peter um, also has a statement about elders. So, this is why I left you in Crete. So, here's where we kind of figure out kind of the nitty gritties of what was going on earlier. But Paul says to Titus, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction and in sound doctrine, and also to rebuke those who contradict it. And then in verse 10, he goes into the false teachers. So he preps, he, he wants the elders to be such that they can deal with, with people who contradict the sound doctrine. Uh, but he also wants elders to be able 
to give instruction in sound doctrine, um, obviously. So I'm going to go to the next slide, and it's going to be a little overwhelming. Um, <laughs> it just if you highlight everything, then don't highlight, right? <laughs> so anyway, the the orange words there, elders and overseer. Um, that's the actual office. That's the actual, you know, what we're talking about here. All the yellow are things that they are to be and really quite incredible. Um, a few notes um, above reproach, um, blameless in some uh, translations. Th there's a word in Greek for being um, spotless. There, there's a word in Greek for being like, uh, without any fault at all, and that's not the word here. The word here is is not the the the, the word that we might equate with perfect. Uh, the word here is that an elder is not to be one who can who just can be blamed and or hence blameless, who can be charged and and just has a life that you know that they're you might say always in trouble or any something like that and we we all understand that um if you know any of our elders or deacons or members or evangelists then you know that none of no human being is perfect um uh, we all have things that we're working on we all have sin in our lives um but the idea here is a a good reputation someone who can't just who isn't constantly you know in trouble or in trouble at all really um Someone who cannot be charged uh, would be a good way to put it. So an elder is to be above reproach. Um, the um, I really like, I had forgotten this is in here, um, but I really like the little statement as God's steward. And I just think that is, is really great. I've just kind of flown over that, I think, before. Um, but an overseer as God's steward. Um you know, and again, it says above reproach. So it's it's mentioned twice, verse six and verse seven, um, to be above reproach. But as God's stewards, um, the elders have been given um, a gift, so to speak. They've been given charge of the members of their flock, and they are to be a good steward of all of us. They're to um, oversee. They are to shepherd. They are um, as elders, like kind of literally as older Christians, should be able to uh, to wisely determine how to make best use of their flock of all their of all their members. So anyway, that, a lot of negative things in there, not or stated negatively. Um, a an elder is not to be arrogant or quick tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy uh, for gain. In contrast to those five negative things. He is to be hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. And then verse 9 is all about being able to handle the truth, handle God's word, hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, be able to give instruction in sound doctrine, and rebuke those who contradict it. So quite, I mean, elders have quite a charge. Uh, they, they have quite a duty uh, in the Lord's church. Yeah, Sandy, go ahead. Um, just, just when you read this as in Timothy, but it just, it just points out that elders of the church are very important. Yeah. Um, I've been in a lot of churches where they didn't have elders. Okay. They, cause they, they say they don't have anybody that qualifies, but they don't have any. Yeah. And I see a big difference in churches that do and churches that don't. And then reading, and when you read this, I think you understand why it is important to have elders. Yeah. Just my, I, just, just my opinion. <laughs> well, no, but your opinion is, is I, I think, uh, right on target. Um, we, um, in, in Ghana, uh, I, I, I was, uh, the, the church I preached at on the, I was only there one Sunday. So this year, uh, the one Sunday, there were, there were 202 people in attendance. Um, and so Victoria and her daughter and her granddaughter and me were taking credit for pushing them over 200. <laughs> but anyway, I'm just, I'm just kidding. But anyway, um, but they had 202 that morning. 
and they don't have elders and they've been in existence a long time. And I, when I did the, um, when I did the preacher training workshop last year in Ghana, um, the, that was what they wanted to talk about. They, they wanted that we did a Q and a at the end every night and they wanted to talk about how to, how to get elders. How do we make this happen? How do we, and then one of the preachers said, I know preaching and they don't, they don't pull any punches. Usually it seems like at least the preachers over there in Ghana, the guy said, and you, there are some in this room and you know who you are. He said, there are preachers who don't want there to be elders because they're scared to lose their job. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy. And I'm sure that's true here in America as well with some of our rural, small congregations. Um, but it is, super important and and i just watching the churches over there or watching the churches in our small towns here um obviously we function so much better it's great to have our you know our elders our overseers yeah sandy go ahead i think i muted. oh i'm sorry oh that's okay that's okay um you so so let's, so what I want though to point out, we, well, I'll, I'll wait till I get to the end of these uh, passages. So 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, very similar. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. Um, last week, we had our staff retreat. So Greg and I, Brandon and Landon, we went off um, for three days. Well, parts of three days, uh, the the last half of the first day, all of the second day, and then uh, just a little bit in the morning on the Wednesday. So we went off on our staff retreat and we pray for everyone in the congregation. We pray for our elders, deacons. Um, we pray for all of our teenagers. We pray for all of the college students. We spend a lot of time in prayer. And what we did, and I was kind of in charge of the prayer time and the devotional time. And so we were looking at various passages in First Timothy. And what I wanted us to do when we read this passage was not to not in any way evaluate, if that makes sense, like not. Um, and of, of course uh, I'll use Ron as the example. Let's just say that he was not hospitable. Let's just say that, you know, he was, he was terrible at that, which he's not, he's, he's very actually very good at that. But anyway, let's just pretend um, instead of griping about, Hey, elder Ron is not hospitable what I wanted us to do was since everyone is growing, hopefully every Christian is growing at all times. So what I was encouraging us to do is every time we get to this passage, not just at the retreat, but anytime and anytime we're praying for our elders, always ask God to bless them, to help them to become more of these things. Cause our elders are obviously qualified. So help them be more above reproach. Help them to have more than one wife. I'm just making sure you're all listening that we did not pray that. Um, but help them to be more sober-minded, more self-controlled, more respectable, more hospitable, to grow in those attributes, to teach even better than they are able to teach now, um, to be more gentle. Um, and then, of course, that they would never drift into being quarrelsome or violent or a lover of money, etc. So the, and we can do that for each other in the church. Uh, we, we have other lists in the Bible, Colossians 3, 5 to 17, uh, the fruit of the spirit, 1 Corinthians 13 on love. Instead of looking at what people are lacking, everyone has some bit of a gift. Um, and so pray for people to develop them. And really as, as, especially those people who are leaders in the church. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to equip. Uh, Greg talked about that Sunday night, and I thought that was really good, but that's the job, to equip the saints. And so, so anyway, so that I think that's important from these passages. 
Um, and then 1 Peter 5, 1 through 3. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder. Peter was an elder. Um, and as and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And so back to our Titus passage. These are the nouns that the elders are, elders, husband, overseer, steward. And then, um, and then of course, we have all the attributes. Let me just throw a few things at you real quick, and then we'll go through the rest of our passage. Um, when you see the word elder, it's, it's equivalent with the idea of a presbyter. Um, and an overseer and bishop are the same, come from the same Greek words. I think the presbyter is like Latin, or I don't know all the, the, the histories of the words. But elder and presbyter is the same. Overseer and bishop is the same. Shepherd and pastor are the same. Um, and so obviously a lot of the Christian world misuses the word pastor. Um, you know, our our elders are pastors, according to scripture. Uh, but a lot of times in other Christian groups, they'll they'll talk about the main minister as a pastor, which they want that minister to shepherd their flock, but they just don't really have the right uh configuration of how that's supposed to go according to the new testament as we're we're pretty aware but those are the words that kind of go hand in hand together um as we see in this passage um the elders are to be a team there's supposed to be more than one elder there's never an example in the new testament of one elder they're to be able to teach that's a very very important thing concerning their work and then i didn't know how to word this because it doesn't say that it doesn't say congregational selection in the passage, but it does, we have here, if you look at all three passages together, you do have the idea that they are to be above reproach twice here and then once in Timothy. Um, the And how would anyone know that they're above reproach except to, you know, ask the flock, ask the congregation. So again, churches do that all sorts of different ways. Um, in this case, in Titus, Paul had left Titus in Crete to appoint elders. And so, um, some, <laughs> excuse me, I'm talking way too much, huh? Um, some people do believe that the evangelist should be the ones to appoint. Um, and that, uh, obviously, that would be the direct New Testament example. But you have an apostle telling the evangelist to do it. And that's what we don't have today. We don't have any apostles running around saying, uh, Greg, will you appoint elders in such and such a place? You know, so we've really lost that. Um, authoritative uh, ability to uh, to do that. So, and by the way, none of us on, on our staff want to do that. Uh, we're very comfortable with how our church does it. Um, and we see three main areas, uh, marriage and family, very important uh, for the overseers, the elders uh, to have their marriage and family in order. Then there are the, the characteristics or the, the the qualifications that have to do with character and conduct and then, of course, doctrine. And doctrine just means teaching. Um, the word doctrine has kind of ended up with a bad connotation. Uh, people say doctrine and people are, ooh, you know, that kind of thing. But it, it just means what is taught. It just means truth. So it, it's it's not a, it shouldn't be a scary word. So, all right. Well, that's a whole lot of info really, really quick. But uh, any, any thoughts about all that or comments about... Um, Verses five through nine, particularly. All right, we have this is just I cannot believe, but we that it's only a quarter till. So very very good. So we'll we'll wrap up here with verses ten to sixteen. For there are many who are in who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers especially those of the circumcision party. So he's saying, especially among the Jews, even though he's going to talk kind of bad about the Cretans in just a minute, the natives to the island. Uh, verse 11, they must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the things that was going on in the first century, people would claim to have special knowledge um, and they would charge people for it. Um, they would 
you know, and, and obviously we do that in the university setting. We we have situations where people pay to be taught, but this is concerning religious stuff. This is concerning salvation stuff and people taking teaching for shameful gain. They were apparently charging, and in, in some other places we kind of know for sure that they were charging. But these people, I mean, just upsetting whole families, just awful things going on. Um, verse 12, one of the Cretans, a prophet of their own said, and this is the quote that in the intro they were saying they were attributing to a certain uh, Cretan poet. But anyway, this Cretan said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. And then Paul says, this testimony is true. <laughs> so anyway, not uh, not being very polite uh, here in this little section. Therefore, he's telling Titus, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. So the goal is to get them to the truth, um, to get them to not, I'll start, I'll continue quoting verse 14, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. Now we're going to look at 1 Timothy. There's a little charge against false teachers in 1 Timothy also. And um, this idea of the myths and really the kind of the feel you get is fairy tales. I mean, just things that are totally false and move people away from Christ and God instead of toward them. Uh, verse 15, to the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. All right, so here's the parallel in 1 Timothy. I'll read it kind of quick, and then we'll go back to Titus and look at a few of the things in that paragraph. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus. Now, remember, this is Timothy now. Uh, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Now, we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. Now, this is right at the beginning of the first letter to Timothy. Um, and Paul just lays it out real quick. All these different things that are inappropriate, unlawful, uh, detestable, um, and contrast that in this case with him um, being entrusted with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God. So, um, in both of these cases, there's quite quite strong statements about the things that are wrong. And of course, we, as as God's people, need to make sure we that we don't back down. Um, you know, language changes over time, and uh, the, the the appropriate ways to communicate change over time, sort of. But we can't be people who are just um, going to keep our mouths shut when when bad bad things are going on. So back to Titus, Titus chapter one here, we, these, these people are initially described as subordinate, insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers. So Paul says they must be silenced and literally they're muzzled, uh, but they must be silenced. They're upsetting people. They're teaching for shameful gain. They're liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Titus is told to rebuke them sharply. They need to move from this devotion to empty stuff, Jewish myths, commands of people who turn away from the truth. If we pull Timothy into this, 
the the genealogies, all those things that are you know not based in truth. Um, these people's minds and consciences have been defiled. Uh, they claim something, they profess to know God, but they deny Him by their works. Uh, our teachings and our actions need to be in sync. And then the just very strong last phrase or last sentence: they are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for any good work. So pretty, pretty amazingly strong stuff. Um, obviously, for us, we want to make sure that we are always subordinate. We want to make sure our talk is not empty, but full of truth. We want to make sure that we're not leading people in the wrong way, uh, but leading them down the path that heads to Jesus Christ. As David prayed at the very start of our class, um, you know, we want to be able to share and share the right way and know the right way to share the right things so that people will uh, come to come to Christ. Yeah, Sandy, go ahead. Did well, you mean to I, unmute? Crete, Crete, Crete was such a bad place, right? bad people in there right but god <laughs> yeah. but god set up a church to save these people why did he just wipe them off the earth like he did sodom boom they're gone yeah well they're not that bad he wants us to save oh, okay. them <laughs> okay. i'm just joking i don't know i don't know no, how they can... no 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 i i i what my what my point is things are so much different since jesus came to earth than what they were before he came. Yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? Am I making yeah. sense? Yeah, absolutely. And and you know, there's there's kind of just a different, you know, we're we're told a couple different things. You know, people, God had patience and tolerance before. You know, we're told, but now the gospel is for all, and and people need to listen. People need to, um, you know, and and God wants everyone to be saved. He wants all these. Right. People described here. He wants them to be saved. Yeah. Right. So yeah, I get exactly what you're saying. Right. Right. Yeah. Very good. Right. Next week we will look at chapter two. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day of our lives. We thank you so much for revealing yourself to us in so many ways, and we we can only pray that that more people and and all people would recognize you and 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 turn to you and uh we we thank you for everything in jesus name we pray amen